This series that we're doing called Cold Case Christianity is authored by J. Warner Wallace, who is, who is a homicide uh, detective with the uh, city of Los Angeles, and he's appeared on all kinds of national TV shows related to uh, solving crimes, including Dateline, Fox News, uh, and he also has a, a, an appearance in the movie God's Not Dead 2, which we actually have in the library downstairs. Oh, he's got to put in a library plug. Um, so he was a committed atheist for many, many years. In fact, in, in, I think early in one of his books, he kind of described himself as an angry atheist. And uh, he, his wife at one point decided that he did want to take their young kids to church. And he was willing to go to church kind of to support his wife. And, and, uh, and so he did. Funny enough, that was kind of how I started going to church. No comments in the back. Um, and one of the things that the pastor said to him, said one Sunday during a message was he was talking about Jesus and that Jesus was the smartest man who ever lived. And that kind of piqued his interest. And so uh, he, uh, he kept thinking about that. Well, if he's the smartest man that ever lived, then I want to know a little bit about you know what he had to say. So he actually... Uh, as an atheist, went to a bookstore, bought a Bible, a red-letter um, version of the Bible, so that he could look at the words of Jesus. And um, as he did, he became very interested in what he read in the Gospels. And so, ultimately, obviously, that led, led to a complete turnaround in his life, uh, because now he's a committed Christian, and and speaks and teaches. He, he eventually went to semer, seminary, uh, and so he, he's pastoring, he's writing books, speaking, he's got websites and YouTube videos, all of this from somebody who is a committed atheist. So uh, it's, again, interesting how often that happens, that, that atheists who truly are willing to investigate what the claims of Christianity they are and lay aside some of their some of their preconceived notions what happens to them and so that's a lot of of what this first lesson is going to be about is is when we go to investigate something there's going to be a lot of cop talk in here uh, okay nothing gruesome although we do have a dead body in today's discussion uh, but as we look at uh, claims there are right ways and look wrong ways to uh, to consider these things so started here. I'm actually going to read just the introduction that's in the workbooks because since you don't have yours, you, were, you wouldn't have a chance to do it. Uh, so I was 35 years old before I first paid attention to a pastor's sermon. This is uh, Wallace speaking. A fellow officer had been inviting me to church uh, for many months, and while I was able to put him off, okay, I'm doing well here. There, then maybe it'll stay out of my way. Get my cord back out of the way. All right, very good. Uh, so I finally, finally attended a Sunday morning service with my family. I managed to ignore most of what the pastor talked about until he began to paint a picture of Jesus that caught my attention. He characterized Jesus as a really smart guy who had some remarkably wise things to say about life, family, relationships, and work. Uh, so I, while I was uninterested in bowing my knee to Jesus as God, I was at least willing to listen to Jesus as a teacher. So a week later, I purchased my first Bible. Something about the Gospels caught my attention more as an investigator than as someone inter interested in the ancient philosophy of an imaginary sage. By this time in my life, I had already served as a patrol officer, a member of the gang detail, the Metro team investigating street narcotics, the SWAT team, and the crime impact team in Vegas investigating career criminals. I'd interviewed hundreds, if not thousands, of eyewitnesses and suspects. I'd become familiar with the nature of eyewitness statements, and I understood how testimony was evaluated in a court of law. Something about the Gospels struck me as more than mythological storytelling. The Gospels actually appeared to be ancient eyewitness accounts. I began carefully employing my investigative training in, in something called Forensic Statement Analysis, or FSA, to the Gospel of Mark. Within a month, in spite of my deep skepticism and hesitation, 
I concluded that Mark's gospel was the eyewitness account of the Apostle Peter. In my current assignment, I investigate cold case murders. Unlike other lesser crimes, an unsolved homicide is never closed. Time doesn't run out on a murder investigation. There are many similarities between investigating cold cases and investigating the claims of Christianity. Cold case homicides are events from the distant past for which there is often little or no forensic evidence. These kinds of cases are sometimes solved on the basis of eyewitness testimony, even though many years have passed between the point of the crime and the point of the investigation. Christianity makes a claim about an event from the distant past for which there is little or no forensic evidence. Like cold cases, the truth about what happened can be discovered by examining the statements of eyewitnesses, comparing them with what additional evidence is accessible to us. If the eyewitnesses can be evaluated and their statements can be verified by what we have available, an equally strong circumstantial case can be made for the claims of the New Testament. But are there any reliable witness, eyewitness statements in existence to corroborate in the first place? This became the most important question I had to answer in my personal investigation of Christianity. Were the gospel narratives really eyewitness accounts or were they only moralistic mythologies? Were the Gospels reliable, or were they filled with untrustworthy, supernatural absurdities? The most important questions I could ask about Christianity just so happened to fall within my area of expertise. I hope to share some of that expertise with you in this study. A quote from C.S. Lewis in his book, God in the Dock, has struck, stuck with me through the years. Lewis correctly noted, Christianity is a statement which, if false, is of no importance, and if true, is of infinite importance. The one thing it can't be, however, is moderately important. The Christianity of true is worthy of our investigation. Okay, so that's basically, um, you know, where he got started with all this. And so we're going to, over the course of these eight weeks, uh, follow his investigation of Christianity, and we're along the way. We're going to learn some some ways to uh, interact with folks who may not believe that Christianity is true. Um, so, for starters, uh, a couple couple things I wanted to talk about. First thing uh, is, uh, how would you define the word faith? Anybody? Believing uh, without seeing, believing something you can't see, um, and, and that's, uh, that's a pretty common, uh, common uh, way to accept it. Some people define faith uh, in, as believing in something uh, even if there's no evidence for it, and that's not necessarily the case. Uh, one of the most well-known of the new, so-called new atheists, Richard Dawkins, one of his books, I think it might be The God Delusion, that's kind of his, the way he defines faith, is you know, believing, or no, he defines it as believing in something in spite of the evidence. So definitions are really important, and especially as you start talking about things of faith with different people, you have to make sure uh, that you're using the same defini definitions of faith, because very often, uh, they'll use a definition for a word like faith, believing in something in spite of evidence, which is much different than, than perhaps a different viewpoint. Same things with words like good. What does good mean? If you're going to have a conversation with somebody about good, good and evil. You have to define, have to have them define what what they mean by good, because it can really, really impact a lot. How about uh, any of you think back to when you, how you became a Christian and what role, if any, did anybody uh, here have uh, uh, a case where evidence of some sort played a, a part in their decision to become a Christian? I know for me, uh, the whole uh, creation argument was something that uh, 
was not so much played a role in my becoming a Christian, but really in reinforcing my faith as a baby Christian. Uh, started to go here to Bristol Springs almost 20 years ago. Wow. Um, but I devoured all the materials down in the library uh, on creation because it was so important to me. Understanding that we're, there are, were alternative explanations. So another a thing maybe to think about, we don't have to discuss it here, is what would you say to somebody who, did, who said they didn't think there was any evidence for Christianity? Hopefully we will talk through some of those issues. We're going to watch a, a short video now. It's about 10 minutes. And um, we'll talk about, uh, he's gonna, Wallace is going to introduce a few key concepts here, and then we're going to talk about them. There we go. What a great setting to talk about the, the role of evidence and how we can use it to determine if Christianity is true. We're in a courtroom in a downtown, busy downtown area, and we've got a chance in a real courtroom to actually talk about the kinds of things we, we actually talk about in a courtroom. So let's just begin with two principles that I think will help you understand the role of evidence in Christianity. Two principles that you can take away and I think will change the way you look at the case for Christianity. The first one is a very simple one. And you might think, really, that's a detective skill? Uh, yeah, it is. And it's simply being able to control your presuppositions. Don't be a know-it-all. It turns out that there's many times, if we're not careful, we'll think we know the answer to something before we even begin investigating. I've had cases where we've been at crime scenes and a senior partner, on the basis of maybe his 25-year experience doing this, will make a quick decision. Oh, I think it's so-and-so. I think it's her boyfriend who did it. Really, we haven't even started to collect the evidence yet. We haven't even started to chart the potential suspects. And you think you already, listen, bud, I've been doing these kinds of cases for 25 years. I, I know when I see it. Now, that person might be right about his inference, but you don't begin by thinking you know the answer to something. If you do, you're liable to over, now as it turns out, I had a case like this where we spent a whole week trying to make find the boyfriend. It wasn't even the boyfriend, it was a brother involved. So you could be very careful about thinking you know the answer before you begin. You have to kind of start by presuming nothing. Start by just looking at the evidence and letting the evidence speak for itself. Now, I say this only because you probably know somebody in your life who has some presupposition which already excludes the Christian worldview. Maybe there's somebody, for example, who says, well, look, unless you can demonstrate something with science, I can't believe it. Well, that's a presupposition they're beginning with that might color the way they're looking at evidence. It might exclude certain uh, approaches to evidence. They might say, well, I don't believe in anything supernatural. So whatever you're going to say about Christianity, you cannot include anything supernatural because I reject the supernatural. Really? Well, we're making a case to determine if something supernatural occurred in the first century. If you're trying to investigate that, you can't begin by thinking you know that nothing supernatural ever occurs. We're all going to have to take our presuppositions and suspend them, at least for a season, so we can look at the evidence fairly. If you're not willing to do that, don't be surprised if you won't come to the right conclusion. And help your friends, help your own kids, help yourself to try to resist the temptation to think you already know the answer. Be fair, be open-minded, and be diligent. Now, now, I want to give you also another way of uh, inferring to the most reasonable explanation. It's something we call abductive reasoning. But before I begin to explain it, let me make sure you understand there's a huge distinction between what's possible and what's reasonable. As an investigator, I don't even care about what's possible. Anything and everything's possible. It's possible that you're not even watching this right now. It's possible you're just dreaming all of this, that you're in a matrix kind of world in which you haven't taken the pill yet to know that you're still in the matrix. That's possible, but it's not reasonable. The standard of proof is not beyond a possible doubt in criminal trials. Why? Because you could never prove anything beyond a possible doubt. Nothing. You could prove beyond it. I could always raise some possible doubt, as ridiculous as it may be. 
The standard is not possible doubt, it's actually reasonable doubt. It's a little bit lower because what we care about is the most reasonable inference from evidence. Now let me tell you how you get to the most reasonable inference from evidence. It's called abductive reasoning, but it's really also known as inferring to the most reasonable explanation. And we do this at every call out, every crime scene. Because sometimes we get there and there's somebody dead, but it may not be a crime. There are four ways to die. Only one of them is criminal. We're trying to figure out, is this a natural? Is this a, an accidental death? Is this a suicide? Or is this a homicide? If it's a homicide, that changes everything. And our entire team is going to get involved trying to solve that. But when you get there, you've got to make a decision. Which kind of scene is it? Well, how do you make that kind of decision? Well, we use abductive reasoning. Now, what that involves is making two lists that begin with E, a list of evidences, all the evidence we see in the room, a list of explanations, ways to explain the evidence in the room. Let me give you an example uh, from a death scene, for example. Okay, we make a list. Uh, we've got some uh, dead guy on the ground. You'll see this in your participant's guide. Uh, we've got a dead guy laying on the ground. And so far, with what little we have, if there's nothing else there, just a dead person laying face down, well, how do we know what kind of death that is? That could be one of those four deaths. Well, we list the evidence. And as the scene is different, if there's a stab, a stab, stab wound or a gunshot wound or if there's a piece of evidence at the crime scene, we will start to cross out those explanations that don't make sense given the evidence in the room. Pretty simple approach. Could you use that approach to examine Christianity? I, well, I think you could. As a matter of fact, I used it as a new Christian or a new investigator of Christianity to really understand the evidence for the resurrection. Now think about that. Uh, we've got a crime scene, an empty tomb, uh, and we have to determine what's the best explanation for it. So let's make a list of the evidences in the room. I'll give you the, the simplest evidences that even the most skeptical scholars, for the most part, to a certain level of certainty will agree on, 70% or so, would say this. Even as unbelievers, they would say, well, okay, so Jesus lived, and he was crucified, and he died on that cross and was buried. Okay, that's a pretty simple claim. Doesn't mean the, the, the resurrection is true. Doesn't mean Christianity is true. Uh, okay, we'll add something to that. How about the fact that um, there's an empty tomb? Oh, okay, but that doesn't mean Christianity is true. I could explain the empty tomb some other way. Okay, how about this? So the disciples, the disciples rather, they, they seem to believe that Jesus actually rose from the dead. They reported it, and they lived their lives as though they believed it. Okay, that's fine, but that doesn't mean Christianity is true. Lots of people believe all kinds of crazy things. How about this? Um, they actually were able to, they were transformed after seeing the risen Christ. I mean, they were so adamant about their beliefs. They, within four or five generations, the entire Roman Empire was being affected by Christianity. That still doesn't mean Christianity is true. Okay, but that's at least the minimal evidence. That's just some simple evidence in the scene that we have to explain. Well, there are a number of ways to explain that evidence. It might just be true. It might just be exactly as the Gospels reported it. The Gospels might just be accurate. Well, as a skeptic, I was, I don't think so. There's got to be another way to explain this. For example, maybe uh, he didn't really die on the cross. If Jesus was only badly injured and passed out, you wouldn't need a resurrection. You could actually, is this a resuscitation? Maybe they hallucinated this. Maybe maybe they lied about it. Maybe there was an imposter involved. Uh, maybe this thing was this story that was changed over time. Do you see how I could offer a number of other explanations for the basic evidence surrounding the resurrection? Well, now we get to employ abductive reasoning. We simply ask the question, do these explanations work given the um, evidence we have in the room? Now, in your participant's guide, you're going to see why I think each of the non-Christian explanations, the naturalistic explanations involving no miracle, involving no resurrection, why each of those doesn't work. They are all fatally flawed. And I, I want to encourage you to look through the participant's guide to see why each of these doesn't work. Well, then you're going to eventually get to the Christian explanation. And I would have told you, though, as an atheist, that that doesn't work either. It's also fatally flawed, I would have said. And you well, why? Well, because it involves and requires a supernatural event called the resurrection. And I would have said, hey, you cannot include supernatural events in history. That's not history. History does not involve miracles. If you, hear, if you read an ancient account about something and it involves an, a, mir a miracle, you're now talking about mythology, not history. It's a category difference. So I would have said, no, I'm out. But... Now we go back to the first principle we talked about in this session, your presuppositions. Be careful about presuming you know for sure that nothing supernatural can ever occur. You don't know that for sure. 
And if you presume that, then of course everything seems silly if it involves a miracle. But what if that's just your bias, your presupposition talking? We said you've got to suspend presuppositions. If you do that, you'll see that the Christian explanation is by far the most robust and efficient way to explain the basic pieces of evidence in the scene. Now, I've given you two skills that I think you can actually use going forward. Presuppositions, making sure you don't have any of those, and two, using abductive reasoning. Yeah. Now, we actually have these call-out bags. These are bags that we use. I, I mean, I get my gloves in here. You name it. I'm always, everything I need, my camera's in here. Flashlights are in this bag. I've had a bag just like it for well over 15 years. And every time I wear it out, I just buy another one just like it. And what do I put in here? I put in here all the stuff that'll help me solve cases. Well, I've just given you two skill sets that you can put in your call out bag. One, be careful of presuppositions. And two, use abductive reasoning to determine what's true. And those are skills you can take with you as you investigate any claim going forward. Those are new skills, new tools for your call-out bag so you can be the best Christian case maker God has designed you to be. So, first lesson in our detective training, we got a couple tools for our call-out bag, right? Um, so the first, first point he talked about there, controlling your presuppositions trying not to be a know-it-all. This is a challenge, right? This is a challenge for all of us, because we all walk into anything with presuppositions, preconceived ideas, what we already believe. And so if we want to have an open, honest uh, investigation of truth, it's so important that we're willing then to set aside uh, and, and think uh, openly um, to, to look at the evidence fairly. You know, like he said, uh, in his past, he would have been of, of the mindset, unless you can demonstrate uh, something with science, I can't believe it. So there's a presupposition that pretty much stops the conversation right there, because if you're willing to look at something objectively, you've got to be able to set those aside and consider everything. Um, so that's... Uh, something different. And, and you know, he talked about uh, juries and jur jurors and jury trials. So uh, if you're selecting jurors for a trial and you're a lawyer, uh, this, is, this is, I apologize for my artwork. That's supposed to be my call-out bag. Um, but let's just talk about what are some possible presuppositions that you might have, that jurors might have, uh, you know, that could be... Uh, Dangerous or, or, you know, bad, something you wouldn't want in a juror. So I'm, I'm selecting jurors. Race. So, yeah, it's more likely that this person committed this, this crime because of their race. Or, or no, it's, it's not possible that they could have committed this, uh, this crime because of their race. So, yeah, race is, uh, is a supposition, uh, especially so... That's something that you, as uh, say the defense attorney, can pick out that you can identify. That's somebody you're going to strike from the jury list because they've identified they're not going to think objectively and fairly about your client because they already have this presupposition that's telling them, yeah, they're more likely to be guilty because of their skin color. Think of another one. Social standing. Yeah, yeah. So, you know, again, that, you know, well, he couldn't have done that because he's, he's uh, you know, high in the community and well-respected, and yet you read the news almost every day, and we know that isn't always necessarily true. But so social standing could be another one. Any others? Gender? What are you trying to say there? Gender. <laughs> Okay, plead the fifth, very good. Uh, yeah, but so race or, you know, people with beady eyes are, are uh, suspicious or, you know, some people might say all cops are liars and, and untrustworthy. And, and, you know, so the same thing, there's uh, that, whole, uh, that whole point of witness selection is to try and weed out some of those types of uh, jurors that might be uh, negatively infecting your client. Um, so the same thing can apply when we start to look at uh, seeking the truth. 
what are some possible presuppositions that uh, can uh, bias you from reaching the truth when you're, when you're trying to seek out truth? We touched on a couple in, uh, in the video. Uh, so, you know, that, uh, for instance, nothing exists outside of the natural realm. Nothing exists outside of the natural realm. What, what, is, what does that mean for a discussion about seeking the truth? Well, it means that if the truth involves a supernatural event, I'm not even willing to consider that. So as you, as you uh, engage with people, sometimes you have to help them understand their biases and work them through that. In some cases, they're going to cling firmly to those biases and not be willing to discuss it. In which case, then, you're, you're basically, the discussion's at an end. If you're not willing to set aside your biases to have uh, an open, honest investigation of truth, then you're more committed to, to where you're at than to really discovering if there is another truth out there. Uh, you know, so similarly, if, if, I can't, if I can't test it with my, uh, my five senses, kind of the same thing. Then, you know, I'm not open to discuss it or, you know, any, we have to eliminate any kind of supernatural explanations for anything. Those are all presuppositions. They basically prevent the witness from openly considering the entire case. Um, So if you're not willing to set aside your, your presuppositions, then you really probably aren't truly interested in finding out the truth. The other thing uh, he mentioned is, is understanding the difference between possible and reasonable. And, and he made the point, you know, in, in, a, in a court case, jurors aren't trying to, or they're not trying to prove something uh, beyond a possible doubt, because there's always some possible explanation, no matter how far-fetched. But it's, it's that idea of reasonable doubt. So you got to look at the evidence and say what's reasonable. Uh, so they use the term uh, ab abductive reasoning. And he said this kind of fast, so I don't know if you caught it on the screen up here. But the word is abductive. Abductive reasoning. And that was... Uh, Basically, then using the, the, the list of E's, the two E's, the evidences and the explanations. So if there is a dead body in the room, it could have been, uh, you know, that person could be dead of, of natural causes. It could be an accident. It could be, um, it could be suicide or it could be murder, right? So have we listed all the evidences? Well, he's got a, a knife in his back. Okay, well, it's probably less likely than that it was um, natural death. It was probably, uh, but then you know, what else is there? More evidence. What else can we learn from from the scene of this crime, and what is it going to tell us? Well, he's oh, he's lying face down, okay, and he's lying in a pool of blood. Well, okay, it's it's definitely it's not a natural death. Um, there's a knife in his back, okay, you know. So now there's there's more we know. Oh, and there's multiple stab wounds in his back. So now we can look at, you know, well, natural death? Uh, yeah, probably not so much. Accidental death? Mm, you know, unless he's in some sort of a knife factory or something, uh, an equipment malfunction, probably not likely. Uh, suicide, uh, you know, multiple stabs in the back? Probably not. So those are all possible explanations at this point, but what's the only reasonable one? reasonable explanation at this point. It's murder, right? It's murder, it's homicide. So that's, uh, that's what he was talking about there, using that abductive reasoning, looking at all, all the possible evidence, 
all the possible explanations and then evaluating what's reasonable uh, out of that versus what's possible. And so that's a skill we can all apply, and we do employ on, um, apply on a daily basis uh, for a lot of different things. You know, for instance, uh, you're, you're going to use some of that type of reasoning for doing things like buying a new car. You're going to you're going to you're going to list out certain things, and you're going to uh, you're going to weigh and decide based on different uh, different categories and come to some sort of a conclusion. So that type of reasoning is something that we employ. And so what we want to do is then learn how we would employ that when we want to help decide what's true, uh, true about God. Uh, Dr. Dr. Gary Habermas, who's another uh, well-known name, uh, he's a distinguished research professor at Liberty Baptist Theological Seminary, and he's investigated the resurrection a great deal. Uh, so he's, he's taken the time to identify what he calls the minimal facts or evidences related to the resurrection. There's many claims in the New Testament related to this important event. Not all of them are accepted by skeptics and investigators. So he surveyed the most respected and well-established uh, historical scholars, and he identified a number of facts that are accepted by the vast majority, majority of researchers in the field. These aren't necessarily Christians. These are historians who are looking uh, at the available information and coming up. So he came up with this list. The minimal facts is Jesus died on the cross and was buried. Uh, Jesus, uh, second fact is Jesus' tomb was later discovered to be empty, and no one was ever able to produce his body. So everybody agrees that's a fact. Uh, it's reasonable. Uh, it's accepted by the vast majority of both Christian and non-Christian researchers. Third one is that Jesus, Jesus' disciples later later believed that they saw him resurrected for the dead from the dead, and they openly claimed that. And that's fact, and we know we, some of that fact is is in our Bible because their writings indicate that they saw him raised from the dead. So that's another fact then that there, there's this open claim that they uh, they saw they believe they saw Jesus resurrected from the dead. Uh, and then the other uh, one, and he mentioned this as well in the video, is that their lives were transformed following their alleged observations. So we actually have a little little diagram then we can we can walk through here and, and kind of look at these each of these claims and, and talk about it a bit. So you know, uh, there's some some possible explanations. Uh, that are, have been put forth over the time. And he mentioned one, which is that uh, Jesus didn't really die on the cross. And uh, this has been put forth over the over the years a number of times. It's sometimes referred to as the swoon theory that you know he, he just kind of passed out took him down, thinking he was dead, but, but he really didn't die. So what are the strengths of that argument? Well, does, it does provide a reasonable, ex, a possible explanation for, for, you know, why everybody thought that he died because they saw him slump over. And, you know, so it's an explanation for that. Any other thoughts on that? But what are the weaknesses of that argument? Sorry? Right. So, you know, you know, as we read the account of the crucifixion, there, there, there is more information given there. Uh, and plus, who was in charge of, of these crucifixion? These were professional soldiers. And their job basically relied on them executing orders, following, following their uh, commander's instructions. And so is it likely that they would have taken somebody down uh, that they were supposed to execute without making sure that person was dead? No, again, that's, that's very unlikely. Plus, you know, you read some of the scripture accounts, his side was pierced, right? 
uh, and, and liquid flowed out. Uh, so, you know, again, there are there are there's other things to consider in order to evaluate that claim, and there there are some things that make it a fairly weak claim because it does not make sense that all these military professionals who frankly executed people on a regular basis and were were required to do so um, by their direct orders of their commanders that they would have failed in that duty, right? So it, it's not reasonable to consider that he just really didn't die. What time are we supposed to Five of? I think five of, but we've got a little bit more time, but running away quickly as always. Uh, another possible, or another uh, a claim that's put out there, or an explanation, is that um, that the apostles lied. They lied. So again, strengths of that argument. Well, it, it's another uh, plausible explanation for you know how this man could have uh, been crucified, dead and buried, and, and, and they just lied about him being resurrected that he wasn't. A they, they lied about it. But what are some of the weaknesses of that argument? Yeah, yeah, thank you, Pete. So, you know, his, his, his story tradition tells us that all of those apostles went to their deaths, proclaiming that to the very end. They were willing to die for that what they were claiming in their belief in. And again, if you're gonna if you're gonna make up a lie, keep that lie alive. How likely are you gonna be able to do that? You know, if I make up a lie between myself and Todd and John, and we're gonna spread that lie. What's gonna happen? Sooner or later, one of us is gonna mess up and accidentally give out something. You know. Uh, I think all of us here are uh, young enough to remember Watergate, but what happened during Watergate? There was there was a cover-up, right? And there were lies that were being told, and what eventually happened is that fell apart very, very rapidly because they couldn't keep that lie alive because there were too many ways that it got found out, and ultimately it fell apart. So to have the idea that these 11 made this lie up, committed their entire lives to keeping this lie alive to the point where they were willing to die horrible deaths uh, and, and keep the lie, you know, uh, I don't have that list with me, but you know, some of them were, were killed by the sword, some were cru one of them was crucified upside down, I can't remember who, uh, was that Peter? Uh, you know, Saw, you saw it in half or torn in two. I mean, just all of them, tradition says, they all went to their deaths proclaiming Jesus all the way. And what else? Then all, uh, all of the, uh, the people that have followed them who've done the same thing, right? Um, it's, it's um, again, not... It's possible but not reasonable because we can look at uh, some of the weaknesses of that argument. Uh, another, another claim is that they all hallucinated it. And again, you know, we can investigate it the same way. Um, and then the last claim, of course, or the last explanation is that the re resurrection actually happened. Look at that as well. So those are the, the tools that uh, he wanted to present, or that we wanted to present for this lesson, is just this idea of, you know, setting aside your your presuppositions, coming into things without uh, unrealistic expectations. And it's important because, uh, you know, there's an, for example, there's some of the additional reading I did this week. We talked in my last class that I did in the spring about a gentleman named Bart Ehrman. Here. R-M-A-N. Bart Ehrman was a Christian. Bart Ehrman went to some, uh, he, uh, 
he studied the Bible, and he actually studied, studied under a very famous Bible scholar, F.F. F. Bruce. Uh, but today, Bart, Bart Ehrman makes a lot of money writing books and giving speeches, uh, basically debunking Christianity, telling people that the Bible is full of errors. What happened to him? It's interesting what happened to him. Is when he was studying scripture, he had such an, a high view of what he thought scripture was supposed to be like. He was expecting it to be perfect. And when he started to study the gospels and found variations and inconsistencies, it rocked his world. And it rocked his world to the point where it took the foundation out from under him. And, and he felt he could no longer believe in the Bible because of these differences this inconsistencies. But uh, those of you who were with me in the spring when we went through that class, you know, we've, we learned a few things about those inconsistencies. 98% of them were just spelling and, and grammatical differences. Uh, you know, when he's looking at the various texts, very few were actually any, anything significant. Interesting thing is, though, those exact inconsistencies that rocked Ehrman's world and, and kind of took the rug out from under him those inconsistencies were exactly what convinced J. Warner Wallace that Christianity was true. Why? He was a cop. He was an investigator, and he's a detective. There's a potential crime that occurred, and I pick full four witnesses, and I put them each in a room separately, and I start asking them questions. They all tell me exactly the same story, word for word. As a cop, I smell a rat. Then I smell a lie that people have made up and they've sat down ahead of time and they've agreed we're all going to say this. The fact that there are differences, there are slight changes, there's changes in wording, tells him as a detective that these are four unique perspectives of the same event told by different people with different uh, you know, backgrounds and different points of view. You know, if I see something happen and I'm standing here, and Todd's standing over there, and he sees the same event happen, he might see, you know, just a person fell over and, and no explanation why. I might see that that person fell over because the guy next to him stuck a knife in him. I didn't see that, so he can't testify to that in his uh, written account because he didn't see it. I saw it, so in my written account, I'm going to mention it. Does that mean that Todd's is a lie? No. doesn't mean mine's a lie means they're two different witnesses who saw two different things. And so as a detective, that those same inconsistencies in the gospel accounts that were part of what, you know, uh, shook Ehrman's confidence are exactly what told J. Warner Wallace that this is real. This smells real because it's exactly what I would expect as a detective to find if I went out to investigate. So it's pretty neat. Uh, let's see, what else? I had a couple other things I wanted to touch on, but I think maybe we've, I think maybe we've hit the highlights. So questions, comments. Oh, yeah, yeah. That he killed her. It happens all the time, right? Uh, you know, hey, anybody who's on the uh, watches the news or is on Facebook, every day, a bit of information will pop up to the surface, and next thing you know, everybody knows exactly what happened, and they're totally convinced. And lo and behold, we have no idea. We have no idea what happened. Sure, that looks like a possible explanation, but there are so many facts that have not yet come to light. Um, but that's pretty much what all of us do now as keyboard quarterbacks uh, can sit, sit down and claim we have full insight to everything because we read it on the internet, right? Other comments or questions? Any particular issues or topics that are of interest to you as we go forward in this? based on conversations or interactions you've had, you know, with 
coworkers, with family members who maybe as you've started to share your faith have put up a stop sign or slammed a door in your face because I can't believe that. I, I've, I've used the example before. Dave Hall shared with years ago when he worked for Kodak trying to witness to uh, a guy, a, a coworker. And the guy basically said, the Bible's just a book of stories written by men. End of discussion. Shut the door. Uh, so, you know, that's the kind of thing that that is not uncommon, you know, and I'm sure as you've tried, some of you have tried to talk to different family members, if there are specific arguments against Christianity that they've brought up, uh, you know, hopefully we'll hit on some of those throughout the course of the class, but if there, uh, there are specific ones you want to share them with me, like I say, I'll probably send that an email sometime this week, feel free to, to reply back and uh, let me know. I'm gonna send out a couple things in my link, uh, one of which is the link to his website where you can go and, and look at more and he's got new videos up and, and things like that. The other one is a great podcast that I've just uh, run across in, in the past month or so called the, the Side B Podcast, moderated by a, a lady by the name of Jana Harmon with the C.S. Lewis Institute. And what she's done is she's done a lot of research former atheists, people who started out as atheists, became believers. And so right now on this podcast, I've listened to, there's 24 of them, I've listened to every one, they're all about an hour long. It's just so fascinating to hear their stories, where they started, what started them on their journey, and where they ended up. But it's also, um, there's a lot to, for us to learn in there because along the way, a lot of them talked about, you know, bad experiences they had with Christians or, you know, I was 30 years old and, and I knew, I, I know that I know people who are Christians. Why didn't any of them ever say any of this? Oof, that was a, that, that's one you don't want to hear, right? Uh, so they're, they're just, they're great. And I, like I say, I've listened to every one. I kind of can't wait for each one to come out and putting out a one, one a week now or one every couple of weeks. But I'll send you the link to those. And, and it's worth listening to at least a few of those because it's great information just about where people who are on the other side of the fence, where they're coming from, what they might be thinking, what their viewpoints might be. And, you know, depending on where, you're, where you are, where you came from, uh, you know, my wife has been a believer since she was, what, seven. So for her, it's, it's not always that easy to put herself in the shoes of somebody who's not a believer. So listening to those podcasts really gives some great, uh, great insight, and some great ideas for how to converse, to, converse with people. So, all right, I'm uh, chattering here. Any last questions, comments? All right, uh, let's pray. Uh, so... Heavenly Father, Lord, we just thank you for your many generous gifts. We pray that we will return your gift of love by loving you in return with all our heart, our soul, and our mind. Help us use our minds as we reason with others about the truth of Christianity. Let us beware of our presuppositions and those of others and engage others with tools of reason that you provide us. We want to share your truth and your love with everyone.